Okay, we get a 2349. Okay, so very, very good player who has won all of his 15 minute games, but okay, let's give it a shot. All right, let's go ahead with e4, c5. All right, let's roll out the Alapin. Knight f6, e5, knight d5, knight f3, d6. Okay, so here in this position, the traditional move is to play d4, but in the Alapin chessable course, they, um, I forget who the authors are. I think it's Genguli and Kazim Janov. They recommend a really interesting idea that I think kind of revives the line, and that's a check on b5. And to like understand the power of this check, you need to be familiar with some of the theory of this line, and particularly with one very important tactic, which might happen, because bishop d7 is the most popular response. Now we drop back to c4. Yeah, exactly. Caucasian Andy actually knows this idea. If the knight drops back to b6, which is a very natural move, knight b6 hitting the bishop, you have this trick, bishop takes f7 check, king takes f7, and most people associate that with knight g5, but knight g5 is wrong. Okay, we we're, we get this. Knight g5 is wrong, king g8 is a dead end. Now then you might say, well, wait a minute, what about queen b3? Isn't that mate? But it's not mate. Black and block with c4. If you play knight g5 and then e6, the bishop moves back to e8. So you actually have to start with e6 check. And amazingly, the pawn is, well, it's not untouchable, but if black takes it with the king, black gets checkmated by force with knight g5 check. And the king is kind of driven out into the open. If black takes it with the bishop, then obviously still knight g5 check and you win back the piece with a slight advantage. This is not a winning line. A lot of times when you play a line like this, you, you kind of hope that, you're winning at the end of it, but white is a slight advantage at the end of this line. Black, okay, he takes on e6. Okay, knight g5 check. And king f6, wait a second. Now, king f6 here, of course, I don't remember exactly what the line is. I have to think. I know that this is that this is bad for black. I know that this is supposed to be supposed to be losing, but of course, I don't remember exactly how. I feel like it's queen f3, but I have to calculate. I'm 99% sure it's queen f3. So queen f3. Yeah, you could also play a slow move here. You could just push like d4, for example, because the black king is not really... The black king is kind of in a box. So oftentimes in these types of situations, you want to play a move that just like solidifies your position and allows you to go for the long run attack. Okay, so let's calculate queen f3. If king takes g5, h4, king g6, we push h5. King h6 is forced. Now we push d4, discovery, g5, takes on passant, and then he goes king back to g7, and it looks like black escapes. So let's do this again. Check takes, h4 back, h5 to the side. Um, do we have any other checks there other than d4? Ah, we have queen e3. That's mate. Okay, I spotted mate there. Queen f3. Queen f3, king takes g5, h4, I think, is forced mate. Although then, wait, king h6 immediately. No, then queen f4 is mate, so. Yeah, th there's mate after queen f3, but the problem is queen f3, bishop f5 is annoying. But if black plays bishop f5, maybe we can go either g4, either g4, or we could go d4. It's hard to say if we should go d4 in this, but my two big candidate moves are d4 and queen f3 check. And it's like, in a classical game, I'd probably take... 30 minutes to decide between them. I think we're going to opt for queen f3 check because I still seem to remember that this is the move. Also, if we push d4, it gives black a chance to save the bishop and put, put it on d5, and then it's harder for us to activate our queen. So queen f3 check it is. Okay, he takes. If I've calculated correctly, it's forced mate. But maybe I have a hole somewhere. h4. I think this is all in the course, actually. Yeah, king h6. So what he forgot about is this queen f4 check idea. And it's just mate with a pawn, the queen, and the rook. That's it. 13 move game. King g6, h5. All theory, by the way. Resigns, yeah. Yeah, this is the power of the Alep in it. It is a very misrepresented opening. It's often represented as this very, like, positional, you know, low-key anti-Sicilian, but in reality, you get a lot, of, a lot of lines like this. If you play the Alep in kind of the modern treatment, 
So it's really interesting how the Alapin has evolved. Originally, it was played very positionally, but now there's been all these, these new finds. And it's actually a super exciting tactical opening, which is why I play it in Blitz almost exclusively. Along with, I also play Knight F3, uh, D6, Bishop B5 check. Well, of course, D6 is not forced. So let's go through some theory. Uh, this was a 12-move game. So you might be thinking, all right, let's just move on. But this is a chance for us to delve into some theory. Um, and hopefully for me to save you a um, maybe on a chessable course. Because remember, the original point of the speedrun is a focus on openings. And I mean, this is a perfect opportunity to, to do that. So yeah, this is a true speedrun game. Okay, so first important point is here. And we've had this before. But just as a review, notice that I played knight f3. The old school move, of course, is to immediately play d4. And you might think that there is no difference because after c takes d4, white typically plays knight f3 here, which is just something that you have to know. Of course, the d takes c3 is not possible. So typically here, black plays either knight c6 or d6, usually knight c6. And then you get the, the, the old main line, which is cd, d6, bishop c4. Now black has d takes e5, which equalizes, but knight b6 is the most popular move. By the way, the, the same trick does not work here because the black bishop is still undeveloped, which paradoxically favors black. Obviously here, black does not have to take the pawn, but actually black probably can take the pawn, uh, but he can also drop the king back to g8 simply. And we have no bishop to take. So here, most people play bishop e5, de knight takes e5 bishop d7 this is all very like very very old theory queen takes d7 knight c3 e6 castles and in this position traditionally black was kind of automatically playing bishop e7 and does anybody know the most challenging move here for white which gives white a small but very nagging advantage like if you can guarantee that black plays bishop e7 then this line is perfectly perfectly acceptable yeah, very good. People know it. Queen g4. Queen g4 is exactly correct. Queen g4 is correct. Now black castles kingside. And here, another very important point. Uh, if you just excitedly play bishop h6, this is a blunder, because black can actually play queen takes d4. Knight defends the queen, queen defends the pawn. And white's queen is hanging. So you have to start with bishop takes c6. This is a move people often forget. You take the knight first. Black typically takes with the pawn. Black can also take with a queen. It doesn't really matter. White plays bishop h6, forcing bishop f6. Now you play rook fd1, and you basically pre-move the move knight e4. Even if black steps away from the pin, you can still play knight e4. All of this has happened hundreds of times in OTB chess, and obviously if black takes the bishop, you take black's bishop, and the pawn structure is ruined. And white has a small but stable advantage. It's like 0.3, according to Stockfish. So... This line is really is really comfortable for white. Unfortunately, in like the last 10 years, in this position, modern computers have indicated that bishop e7 is not only not forced, but there are better moves that equalize immediately. The most incisive one is just to play a6 and to immediately force white's hand. So of course, typically white takes on c6, black takes with the queen, and by delaying the development of the bishop, you're taking the sting out of this queen g4 idea. So for example, I think white usually plays bishop e3 here. Black can centralize the knight. And this is just a dead equal position. Dead equal position. White is not worse, but white has no advantage. Like rook c1, bishop e7. And if you play queen g4 here, then black can eliminate the bishop, bishop before castling. F takes e3 castles. And black is completely fine. Just equal position. So... At a lower level, I think this old line is very, very good because a lot of people still don't know the theory and they will stumble um, as early as like this position. They will play something weird uh, or like in this position, they'll play the move E6, which is a viable alternative. But this transposes into a line that's very promising for white. But at a higher level, at the level that we're at, I like the new chessable, well, not the new chessable move, the, the newer move, which is knight F3. And the idea is that if black plays knight C6, our opponent played d6, which is a completely different line. But if black plays knight c6, you immediately play bishop c4. You actually skip the move d4 entirely. Now, if black plays e6, now you play d4, 
And generally, we transpose to a, a promising line that we just had via the other move order. But if black drops back to b6, we drop back to b3. And this leads to a completely different type of position that is a lot more tactical. It's also a lot more theoretical. You have to know quite a bit if you want to play this position with white. But in my opinion, it's extremely promising. And some cool new ideas have been found in the main lines here. Now, I could spend like an hour and a half talking about the theory. I'll kind of try to summarize it in, th in three minutes. Black has um, two main moves here. There's c4, which is very natural, trying to prevent white from pushing d4. And then there is uh, d6 or d5, which is essentially the same thing because you're going to play on facade. And then typically black plays queen takes d6. You castle, and one amateurish trap is that if black plays bishop g4, even GMs miss this sometimes. Of course, there's this classic bishop f7 and knight g5. So that's a good perk of this line. The main move is bishop e6, trading off the light squared bishops. And in this position, a new idea was found about a year ago that like completely rejuvenates the line. Um, in the old days, this position was considered to be dead equal. Like There was absolutely nothing. White used to play d4 automatically, and then there were trades, and it was a draw. But then this a4 idea was found. And ever since then, black has been in pretty significant trouble in this line. And I've actually had a speedrun game exactly with this variation. So perhaps this is familiar to some of you. I've also played this a lot in Blitz. The point is very simple. You're trying to drive this pawn up to a6, provoking weaknesses on black's queen side. So typically, black steps away with a queen, obviously to prepare e6. White pushes a5. Black centralizes the knight. You push a6. And only now you push d4. And suddenly, you get this very big initiative in the center. And it's very hard for black to make a move. Like if black just blindly trades everything, you centralize your queen, the queen aims at g7 and makes it very difficult for black to get the king side out. Your knight can come around to c4. You can play pawn c4 in some cases, rook d1. So you can explore this via the other speedrun game. I'm just giving you kind of the executive summary. If black pushes c4, then in this position, once again, black can again play the move d6. And then you get this very interesting line. And again, White's idea typically is to push a4 and develop the knight to a3, as is very standard in the Alapin. Or black can go after your pawn and play queen c7. And here, the new idea is to just sacrifice the pawn and castle, which is yet again has completely like rejuvenated this system. If black accepts the sacrifice, okay, this is like very high-level theory. This is why like I wanted to end the speedrun earlier, because you get into these situations where if you're a higher rated player, you just have to know a, know a lot and things don't necessarily have kind of internal logic. Here you play a4 and it turns out that white is actually much better in this position. Despite being down a pawn and despite having almost no pieces developed, white is, it's like plus one, this position, which is crazy to me because if you look at this with kind of an untrained eye, it looks like, for example, black can just push d5. How can black possibly be worse here? But the way I would explain it is white's position has tremendous potential energy, which is a concept I haven't like talked about in a while. Although white is currently not very well developed, once you push d3, all of your pieces come alive. The bishops are nicely aiming at the king's side. The rook can come to e1 with tempo. You're about to knock the black knight to a very awkward square, which is going to happen right now. You're going to play a5, forcing the knight back to a square where it blocks the development of the bishop. Now we can, of course, throw in the move rookie one. Okay, let's say black goes queen c7. And now uh, you can actually start with knight a3. Your knight is aiming for b5. Technically, you're sacrificing another pawn. But what happens if black takes it? Now you open up the center with d3. And, well, the c4 pawn is now hanging, so black typically will take. After queen takes c3, the game is already over. Now, all of a sudden, white's position is, is breathing. And if black pushes e6, there is a simple tactic here. See if you can find it. White to play and cash in on the initiative. And th the point of this tactic is to win material. White to play. Yes, very good. Knight b5, queen takes a1, knight c7, king d8. And now a very high-level detail, right? You want to know what high-level tactics entail. 
But this is a great example. Everybody like under 2000 automatically plays bishop g5, just automatic move. But black can play king takes c7 and get the bishop out. And okay, black has a rook, a piece, and what, two pawns for the queen? White is probably winning here, but it's not convincing. But the higher rated player says, wait a second, I can actually desperado this knight. I can take, take out the e6 pawn. Only now I can play bishop g5. And this pawn makes all the difference. Why does this pawn make all the difference? Because now e6 is a huge target. And even visually, this looks completely different. Like the, I guess the f7 pawn technically is the one that is gone. And without that pawn, black lacks structural integrity. These pawns are weak. White is, it's plus, plus five, actually, according to the engine. Which is why it's a good practice in general to always pause when you're about to make an automatic move. And I'm not talking a move that is literally forced. If a move is literally forced, it's stupid to just like think. But moves like bishop g5 are in the category of automatic moves, where you just assume that this is the only logical thing to do. This is where you want to pause and see if you can find a way to slightly improve the tactic, which can be the difference, let's say, between a slightly or clearly better position and a completely winning position. I wish I had like a ready-made example of this, and I'll, I'll think about it, but I don't for, for the moment. Where were we? Yeah, queen c7 castles, sacrificing the e5 pawn. I think you kind of get the point. This a4 idea is super, super strong. Um, and you can find more information in the chessable course. I had a over-the-board game about a year ago against a Chinese GM, Zhu Jin Chao, where he played d6, takes, takes, castles, bishop g4, rookie one. So this is another line that you can explore uh, on your own. But here, also, white, I think, is quite a bit better. Okay, so that is essentially black's options after bishop c4. Our opponent played a completely different line, which is the immediate d6. And here, again, a new idea has been found, and it's this check on b5 that looks very superficial. But as you could see from the course of the game, it actually contains a very deep idea. You're trying to provoke bishop d7 and now drop back to c4. Obviously, in context of the game, you should be able to understand why bishop c4 immediately is bad. Well, it's bad for several reasons, but the main one is that black can step back to b6. And again, this trick doesn't work anymore because black can just duck away to g8. So in effect, you're provoking bishop d7 and then dropping back to c4. So you might ask, well, what if black doesn't play bishop d7? Well, the only other feasible move is knight c6. Knight d7 is very awkward. Nobody plays like that. If black plays knight c6, then you can castle. And again, it's kind of a theme in this line that you delay the move d4 until the proper moment. And here again, black is in quite a bit of trouble. So for example, if black plays bishop d7, now it's finally time for d4. And black's position is like collapsing. This knight is very vulnerable. Black's king side is not developed. It's a really, really bad position. If black plays cd, you can actually push c4, a very weird idea, push c4, force the knight back, takes takes develop with tempo this is at least the line in my file bishop e7 takes or no first you take on c6 bc takes takes rookie one 96 94 and white is clearly better castles and you bring out your other knight uh, much better by the way than knight f5 which would be very greedy another example of an automatic move that a lot of people would make and just forget that after queen f6, black is counterattacking b2. You have to prioritize development. And here, white is, eh, I would say, clearly better because black is saddled with these two weaknesses. So I've had this exact sequence quite a few times because it's relatively forced. And I would say that what this shows you is that at, let's say, every, a level over 2,000, every level over 2,000, learning openings is kind of glamorized, but it shouldn't be. like at least 75% of it is just going through these types of variations and memorizing them and understanding them. And then you might ask, well, are there any ways that I can help myself memorize them? Of course, you have to know the ideas and you have to put in like memory markers. Like you have to remember particularly the unusual ideas that can help you anchor the line in your memory. For example, here, the unusual idea is that when black plays C takes D4, you actually push C4. You don't see that a lot in the Alapin. Um, so you might tell yourself, okay, in this line, I have to remember to push C4. You can also tell yourself, like in this line, 
I have to remember because of this bishop takes f7 check trick, I have to provoke bishop d7, which is why I should give this check first. So this takes some extra work, but it can really help you not forget these lines over the board. Okay, bishop d7, bishop c4. Now, knight b6 is a mistake. The best move in this position is e6. Yeah, e6 is the way for black to equalize. But this still leads to a very exciting position where, where white can put a lot of practical pressure on black. Here the move is d4. And after c takes d4, okay, you can do several different things. I forget what the chessable course actually recommends here. You can check this on your own. But one really interesting idea is actually to castle kingside. If black plays d takes c3 and continues to eat up pawns, then you take the knight. Bishop d5, ed, and now knight takes c3. With a huge development advantage, black center is collapsing. And this is how you play the Alapin in 2023. Takes bishop g5. You're just continually ignoring all of black's pawns that are hanging, and you're prioritizing development. And if black plays f6 here, white to play and deliver a powerful crushing blow. Who can spot it? 2024, yeah, I said the year wrong. Knight takes e5. I'm still making that mistake 18 days into the year. Knight takes e5. I like moves like that. Both pieces are hanging, but black can only take the bishop. Now queen h5. Here, here, hg. And obviously you don't take the rook, you take the pawn. Knight takes d5 is mate. Yeah, this line is very yesterday, exactly. So, so that's basically the idea of this line. You're prioritizing development. So d takes c3, you take the bishop, uh, take the knight. If black plays, well, if black takes the pawn here, that, I mean, this line is equal, but it's kind of dangerous for black. Like you can play knight takes pawn. And now again, if black plays pawn takes pawn, here you can take twice on d5, and you've got a big double attack on these two pawns. So black has to know this move, knight b6. This is not an easy move, stepping back to b6. And you kind of play the smith Mora style. You just drop your bishop back and you say, okay, you can take my pawn on c3, but here I can even throw in the move queen h5 with a huge initiative. G6, obviously the idea is to step back to f3. And you're never afraid that black like takes all of your queenside pawns. That's beside the point. Yeah, really good line. This bishop b5 check is a very problematic move. Black can equalize with careful play, but I mean, I would say at all, at all levels below 2,500, this is super, super challenging. This is why I recommend the Alapin to lower rated players. Okay, so knight b6, and now bishop f7 and e6 is a really sexy trick. Our opponent played bishop takes e6, allowing us to demonstrate the forced mate. Of course, the relative lesser evil. Actually, the funny thing is when you run this on the computer, it says that this is equal, but we'll get to that in a second. A lot of people, they get scared and they play king g8, which is understandable. But this position is just terrible for black. When queen takes d7, you start by castling. Okay, let's say black plays knight c6. Here, it's a very good idea to push a4. Again, familiar idea, a4. If black pushes a5, you can pick up the knight with a fork. And if black plays, I don't know, e6, whatever, now you can push d4. Sorry, takes, takes, and then knight c3, and then a5, and rook e1, and black's position is just clearly visually terrible. There's not much to analyze here. Um, so the only testing testing continuation is to take the pawn. Black can also take it with the king. And this, paradoxically, will transpose into the game because we're going to do the same thing. We're going to go knight g5 and queen f3. And if black takes on g5, he gets mated exactly, well, not exactly like in the game. Here, you have to know a very important move, which leads to forced mate. And it's actually not h4. The best move is not h4. It's, yes, it's queen f7. And this type of move is the hardest to find when you're engaged in a king hunt because you're tempted to give a bunch of checks. But oftentimes these restricting moves set, set up the mating net much more effectively than just like a barrage of checks. If you go d4 and get excited about the discovery, the attack fizzles out immediately, king g6. Black runs away. So what you have to do is block off, essentially block off the escape to f7. And that's it. If black steps back to h6, now you can go d4 and simple h4. 
and then h takes g5 is going to be mate on the next move. And what this reminds me of, this reminds me of a particular move from a combination that I've always found very instructive exactly on this topic. And then we'll probably wrap up. Let me find the game. This is a very famous game. Yeah, so this is a game that is featured in a lot of combination books, and it's like a stock puzzle. It's white to play and win. Petrosian finds a combination. He actually had this on the previous move and missed it. Uh, on this move, he found it. And it's simple. It's queen takes f6 check, which kind of comes to mind. King takes f6. Bishop e5 checking g5. This is the instructive position, though. This is where a lot of people slip up, especially newer players. Um, and newer players, they look at this and they want to go h4, which is a really bad move because, again, it, it makes the same mistake. You, you actually help the king escape. Same with f4. The move is not rook h4 because here black can actually block off the rook with h5. But the correct move is bishop g7. The same category. It's a quiet move that restricts the escape squares. And why is this move hard to find? It's kind of because you're down a queen and you want to play quickly. But it's not like white's king is in any danger. So you're not really in much of a hurry. Bishop g7 finishes immediately. It's forced mate in like two or three moves. So whatever. Like Bachman resi resigned, but like this is mate. I guess h4 is probably not act. No, h4, knight, h4, gh. Okay, it's mate. It's it's still mate. Yeah, either way, there's a million different mates. So this is kind of the point that I'm trying to illustrate, which is that when you are engaged, particularly in a king hunt, you should not rush to give the most obvious checks. You should usually start by identifying the potential escape routes and, to, and seeing if you can make one of those slow, restrictive moves that set up the mating net, um, like queen f7 in... Our current game. Yeah, so queen f7, and now d4 is... Okay, the 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 computer line is g6, check. Okay, d3 or d4, now h3, which is an obvious move. You're setting up g4. Technically, it's another quiet move, but I would say this is a very straightforward move. What about here, check here, knight d2, and the knight is coming to f3. That's it, it's made in two. Yeah. Very nice way that the pieces cooperate in this line. You're using almost everything. So anyways, that is why black has to play bishop f5. Now remember where this came from. This came from king takes e6. Our opponent played bishop e6, but we could have gotten exactly the same thing. If in this position black had played correctly the move bishop f5, we get exactly the same position, interestingly enough. And this position is assessed by the computer as equal, which is obviously a massively misleading assessment because after white plays g4 black has a incredibly difficult defensive task ahead of him black has to play ultra accurately here to maintain the balance um, so black has to play e6 here which is not a very difficult move i mean white is threatening maiden one you have to defend the bishop now you play knight e4 check you need to throw this move in forcing the king back to e7 which by the way is another semi-difficult move. King f7 is much worse because you take, and now you have queen h5 check. So black has to know king e7. Okay, you play g takes f5. This still looks terrible for black, but it turns out that after ef5, queen f5, queen d7, white's, it's not like white's attack fizzles out. White's attack continues. You drop your queen back. Black plays knight c6. You play d4, opening up the bishop. But if black plays this super accurately, he can keep the balance. CD. Now, you're actually not supposed to play bishop g5 check. You're supposed to recapture. Now we're getting into like computer theory, which is not very interesting nor very instructive. For most people, it's enough to remember to give this check and then to meet bishop f5 with g4. And then it's important to remember this move, knight e4. And that's enough. You don't really need to remember anything else. Okay, if your opponent has done his homework, done their homework and knows like an 18 move line and equalizes congrats but this is this is chess like this is going to be true of every opening that you play by the way if black plays g6 here that's actually losing because after gf gf you can go queen h5 and suddenly you're coming around to f7 black can't stop that so e6 also not a given the black black knows um of course you might be watching this as a beginner and saying well isn't all of this unnecessary? Like, how is this going to help me at all? And yes, I mean, the, the theory itself might not be directly helpful, but 
hopefully you still find the lines like entertaining and when you get stronger they're going to help you but you know we're at a high level in the speed run so i'm kind of tailoring the theory to higher rated players but yeah king takes g5 obviously forced mate the prettier line though is king g6 this is the prettier line here and this is what i was trying to remember after h5 king h6 actually white has to find queen e3 check which is easy once you get to this position but the temptation to play d4 is extremely strong but d4 squanders the whole advantage black plays g5 you take on Poseidon and black escapes to g7 with just a completely unclear position there's no mate if you go bishop h6 the king has escaped all the way back to g8 and we're screwed um so actually the correct move is queen e3 forking the bishop and the king g5 takes and a beautiful mate h6 and yeah this is a gorgeous line in general this is really really nice this bishop f7 line just aesthetically aesthetically very pretty so this is great good stuff to remember this can win you a bunch of games it won us this game okay our opponent played king h6 here of course again again d4 is very very bad so weirdly enough you actually don't play this discovered check often here again black plays g5 boom the king escapes to g7 and we're in trouble so here the correct move is queen f4 and okay obviously you get made in one so yeah so clearly this guy was 23 40 i mean uh just didn't know the line and figured that i was bluffing and went for it too quickly and got checkmated and this is why you know like if you really want to supercharge your improvement as someone who doesn't have a lot of time to invest in chess but let's say you're like 17 1800 and this is the benefit of like learning a chessable course is you, you're going to win countless games like this and you might say well is this really in the spirit of improvement like why not since the resources exist you might as well capitalize on them so it was a very short game Perhaps some people are not very satisfied, but I think we converted it into a semi-instructive analysis session, which was focused on theory, but hopefully you found it instructive. Obviously, we didn't cover the e6 variations, like if black plays e6, and again, if black plays d6, this is a whole separate line. Black also has the move b6, which is a very reputable sideline. So this doesn't cover the extent of the knight f6 variation. Um, there's a lot of theory in the Alapin that you have to know, but not as much as in the open Sicilian. It's far from as overwhelming as, let's say, learning knight f3 and d4, which I don't recommend to anybody. I think the Alapin is far more practical to learn in a couple of weeks, and hopefully with the aid of the speedrun. Okay, this is where we will end. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks for hanging out. See you guys soon.